Uh, API, mixtape volume two. Uh, Whoop. Yeah. Please help me introduce Ethan Kurzweil. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks for that kind introduction, and thanks to Greg and um, the whole team for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I know I'm between you guys and lunch, so we'll try to keep this lively and entertaining. And if there are questions, feel free to shout them out or raise your hand, and I'll try to, I'll try to look out at the audience. Um, as, um, as was said, I'm a partner at Bessner Venture Partners, and I've been investing in the developer ecosystem for about nine years. Um, the traditional wisdom going back you know, a couple decades was that selling to developers was just not good business, that you couldn't make a lot of money, you couldn't sell enough, you couldn't get to the kind of enterprise budgets, the kind of price points um, that you need to build a big business by selling to developers. And we noticed about a decade ago that a couple of shifts were happening that actually led to, uh, led to everyone reconsidering that notion, that made it actually for the first time really attractive to sell to both a developer, a DevOps professional, a technical buyer, um, and we're going to talk about what some of those enabling factors are and then what, what we saw in terms of the development of a whole economy of really interesting companies that have as their principal buyer, the principal decision maker, the principal user, the technical buyer, the developer. Um, so I'll take you through a little bit of what's, what drove my particular interest in this, what we call roadmap area and this theme, uh, and then talk about what are some of the enabling characteristics that we think allow for businesses like this to be, to be strong business? Why, why are these business models good? And what's changed in terms of the way software is bought and sold, the way software is developed, uh, the way cloud computing has um, allowed for um, the technical buyer to access software more quickly that's enabling this theme to be, uh, to be investable for us and to produce what is now quite a few great companies. There's actually five or six public companies now that sell to developers that have just gone public in the past couple of years and are some of the strongest performers in the, um, in the recent batch of IPOs. So we'll talk about a lot of that and then we'll pull up um, uh, some uh, CEOs that I've had the pleasure of backing with and I'm gonna ask them to critique my speech, tell me what, was, what they agree with, what they don't agree with, and, um, and we can have a kind of dialogue around how to actually build a company like this. Um, so it turns out developers have actually always been a valuable audience. Um, we did an analysis going back a number of years looking at Microsoft versus Google. Uh, I checked actually this morning, Microsoft's still a more valuable company than Google by, by a little bit. Um, and one of, the reasons that, one of the reasons for this, one of the enabling factors, has been to, uh, Microsoft's control over a developer audience. There's 8 million .NET or estimates, you know, around 8 million .NET developers in their ecosystem. They've had a major investment in, in kind of a server and tools division. And you can see, if you look at their revenue by segment, the chart on the right, the fastest growing component of Microsoft's revenue has been the server and tools, more than Office, more than Windows. It's been the server and tools division. And as they brought more and more functionality there, their ownership of a captive pool of developers is what's enabled uh, Microsoft to stay as relevant as they've been, even in spite of some missteps and not, um, not moving to the cloud as quickly and their mobile missteps and a lot of the stuff you've read about. But this has been a consistent theme. I mean, you remember Steve Ballmer running around the room yelling, developers, developers, developers. They really got that right. And it's enabled them to have kind of a second life as a company uh, into you know, what is a you know, quite obviously quite valuable, almost trillion dollar business. Um, the left chart there shows their free cash flow and compares it to Google. It's twice as big as Google, and so they've really harvested the fruits of, of that early investment quite nicely. Um, and then you see that this is not a theme that is lost on them. They just spent quite a bit of money to acquire GitHub because of that um, control over a developer audience and access to what is a really fertile pool of, of, of developers. Um, the thing that's changed, though, because I talked about decades ago this not being really an exciting area, is the empowerment of developers. Here's kind of the popular perception of developers. You know, folks you just sort of threw work at. Uh, they were the butt of a lot of jokes, cartoons, things like that. There's, there's going to be an office space bit coming up. Uh, software always got purchased top down. There's a reason that this particular parad paradigm is prevalent, because software got purchased top down. Developers weren't making the decisions about what tools to use. It was made by a, a CIO or a CFO or a purchasing department. Uh, and they just sort of told developers what to do. And so the popular perception of developers was more like this on the left versus today we now have, and I, I checked recently, I haven't updated this, but there are now five or six public companies with a developer, an engineer, with an actual, someone that codes running the company, like my, Mark Zuckerberg in that case. Um, 
that someone who's classically trained in that way are now you know, CEOs of you know, Fortune 500 or you know, very, very powerful businesses. That's a new thing. That, that did not exist uh, even, five, even you know, 10 years ago. Um, and there's more of them than ever. I mean, um, you, you look at the, the stats on most popular majors coming out of um, uh, the university system. Uh, computer science is one of the most popular and growing in popularity. Uh, there's actually 26 million, this slide's a little out of date, 26 million global developers that are defined as a developer in some way, growing at a 5% rate. I, I suspect that that CAGR number may even be higher if, you, if we were to update that for today's numbers. So it's an audience, it's engaged, they have purchasing power, um, and they're big. And so this is now a, 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 an area that I think is a fertile place to innovate is to, and, and to sell you know, what, is, um, what are big ticket software items. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about the, the buyer here, the technical audience. Um, why, can, why can the businesses that sell to them, why are those good? Because that's just because you have you know, someone that likes to experiment with software and has purchasing power, doesn't mean the business is going to be necessarily great, and actually there's some factors here that cut in favor of making these businesses really, really strong. And, and I'll show you some public companies and how they manifest in terms of their um, you know, expense ratios and things like that, but it boils down to a couple things. Uh, developers will buy tools to make their job easier. Uh, they'll use PagerDuty rather than configuring their own notification system. They'll use Periscope data, just to use the examples of folks who are gonna join me on stage, um, you know, rather than you know, doing SQL queries on their own because those tools make their job easier. It's an audience that is willing to uh, buy stuff, buy technology to help expand their power and functionality. Um, cloud computing changes the second point, which is about the friction involved in purchasing software. You can send a text message with Twilio for two cents and see how that might work, test it in a small environment, swipe a credit card, when you're programming some sort of complex application that has a notification portion of it, you can see how this might work uh, before you have to rope in a whole IT team and do a whole purchasing and a whole RFP or any of that stuff. Uh, you can just sort of try out the tool. And so this, this sort of easy API economy, easy to consume SaaS products allow developers to test things out easily. Uh, and that's a, new, that's a new advent with cloud computing in the last you know, 10 to 15 years. Um, the third point is actually really significant. And we'll, we'll talk about some of the enabling factors of these businesses and why, why that particular point matters. But there's an easy path to revenue expansion. So if a developer bought a plan from Twilio that incorporated you know, a couple hundred text messages, and that's all they ever bought, that wouldn't be that interesting of a business. You know, that's that's you know, tens of dollars. But there's this very easy path as businesses grow, as developers come to rely on the pieces of functionality that they're using, to spend more and more money doing that. Um, you test something out, it works, you're gonna hook it into your system. You try PagerDuty in one team, it works, there's a natural expansion path to other teams within that enterprise. Uh, and this, this path to revenue expansion is actually quite remarkable. It's not, it's not just the case that, oh, well, maybe you know, these things hop from one team to another, or you know, you, you're buying something and then you buy a little more of it. They can be, they can be you know, an order of magnitude more purchasing going on down the road than the initial purchase up front. And so you see models where folks are trying before they're buying in very small scale, trying out a product, and then there's this remarkable sort of 10, 100 fold increase in, in amount of revenue that, the, that that particular customer is worth because of this easy path to revenue expansion because they rely on the tool and they start using it and they scale up with it. Um, social media, blogging, evangelism tends to be a great way to spread developer products that can be a lot cheaper than big enterprise sales, you know, with the, all that comes with big enterprise selling. Uh, and so developers talk and they spread new technology. Developers is a very hard audience to sell to, which, is, which is a, has, a, has a pro and a con to it. The con, obviously, is it's hard to sell them something. The pro that is if it's really great, they're going to find out about it anyway. And so through focusing on innovation and through focusing on product development, oftentimes the best products win and you don't have to spend a lot of money to get them out. Um, and then I made the last point, you know, top-down sales doesn't, doesn't work as well. Once you get into big enterprises, there is a little more of an aspect of enterprise selling that comes in there. But again, it's all aided by the fact that by the time you're talking to, uh, um, you're sending an enterprise 
sales rep out to talk to, to a company, they're probably using or testing the product in some way. There's that very easy trial because of the cloud and because they can, they can try things out uh, in their environment. And so you're not selling some new concept, you're selling something they're already using and you're saying, hey, wouldn't you like to do more of this? Um, so the result of these things, if you think about sort of the core equation of what makes a business valuable, there's sort of, you can really boil it down to two components. One is what's the, um, what's the cost to acquire uh, customers? How much are you spending on non-product development stuff like sales and marketing and other things? Uh, and if you look at this, is, we took a random snapshot of IPOs from two different years, 2015 and 2016, and stack ranked them according to the percentage of their revenue that they spend on sales and marketing. Uh, and not surprisingly, the developer business, Atlassian, Twilio, Shopify has some elements of this, uh, tend, to be the lowest, tend to be the lowest on this. It's the least amount of spend on sales and marketing, which enables you to put more money into product development, engineering, reliability, security, all the stuff that actually directly translates into um, uh, you know, making a product better as opposed to just, just selling it. Uh, and, and you can see this manifested in this chart. The other equation of what makes a business good is what's the lifetime value of customers. Um, and here again, these businesses have some favorable characteristics because if the product works, there is an easy path to revenue expansion, as, as, I, as I said earlier. The customers are going to buy more and more of it. There's a downside to that too. There's also an easier path to churning off of it if the product doesn't work. So reliability and all those other things that I mentioned, solid product development, solid design, solving the unique pain point of customers, those tend to be the things that these, ten, these businesses differentiate on as opposed to just being able to sell things really well at effective sales force and things like that. Um, and we'll talk to the CEOs in a minute about how they, how they instrumented, how they built their products early on with that in mind. Um, you know, this can result in some exceptional businesses. We pulled out Amazon Web Services. It's obviously part of Amazon, but they've started separating out the results for AWS from Amazon, so we can kind of see a little bit uh, what, what AWS would look like if that were a business. And it would be the most, power, it would be the most um, valuable developer business in the world, uh, given you know, the characteristics of it. It's a $12 billion run rate business almost, uh, this is as of last year. 60% uh, growth rate, so still growing really healthily. And a lot of the reason for that growth is that revenue expansion. Just think about it, you, use, you deploy some, uh, some EC2 instances, it works, you move more and more production workloads to the cloud, that results in revenue expansion for Amazon. Um, strong operating profit, because again, the, there are not a lot of traditional sales and marketing activities that go on there. I mean, there are, but they, they, have, they benefit from this sort of organic adoption of AWS. Um, and then we estimate according to um, uh, some, some bankers, if you looked at AWS as a standalone company, it'd be worth over 120 billion. I actually think that number is higher today given that they've continued to grow at the same rate since, since 2017. Um, so not all developer businesses benefit from these characteristics. And so what we tried to do in figuring out our investment hypotheses and our, our investment thesis at Bessemer is we tried to distill down what are the characteristics of the businesses, the ones that are gonna be enduring companies, that are gonna go public, or that you know, are gonna have a lasting place in the landscape. What, what characteristics do they have that separates them out from the pack, that separates them out from you know, other businesses that don't benefit from these characteristics. And so we came up with the seven commandments, excuse the uh, biblical reference, but we wanted to have a little fun with this. Um, the seven commandments for investing in developer platforms. And I'll talk through each of these, but they directly relate to some of the points I've already made around why this is an interesting area to invest in at all. Um, and I should say, by way of disclaimer at the outset, that not every great business is gonna, is gonna uh, check the box on each of these things. There are some businesses that, that don't exhibit one of these effects, but for some other reason, it's really strong. But by and large, as many of these things as exist, we, f we, we think there'll be sort of stronger, more defensible businesses that will be created. Um, so the first is delivered as a metered service. That's, uh, again, going back to my Twilio example, that's pretty obvious how that works. You know, the more communications tech you consume, the more you're paying, you're paying, the more you're paying for. Uh, and so as much as you can relate to a usage-based pricing model, the better you are because, again, it all relates to revenue expansion. As you're using more and more, you're paying more and more, which results in, uh, which results in that longer lifetime value. Um, grows with the business. This is linked to number one, uh, but a little bit different in that when the underlying business is successful, let's think about uh, all the technology services that Uber uses in its early days. As Uber gets big, 
are they ending, paying more and more for those things? Are they spending more on AWS? Are they spending more on Twilio? Are they spending more on other uh, types of services that they're, that they're consuming? Um, if you can architect a business model such that revenue grows as the underlying business gets more successful, even if you don't do anything else, they're just paying you more and more because it's metered or for some other reason, that tends to put you in a stronger position, again, in terms of higher lifetime values. Um, Number three, does it replace something that businesses already pay for? Uh, that's useful in that at a certain point, when developers are choosing uh, a piece of technology to use, they will run up against a ceiling in terms of some budget in the enterprise that they, are, that they need to take spend from in order to keep spending you know, more and more money on a particular service. And we found it's a lot easier to have those conversations internally when it replaces some other functionality. And so the, going back to my AWS example, that's replacing servers and, and uh, engineers to manage them and air conditioning and electricity costs and all that kind of stuff. It's easy to say, hey, we're not going to spend on that anymore. We're going to spend on AWS. As opposed to, and this is where a lot of businesses do get stuck, is it's some new great cool thing that's going to make developers more productive, but it doesn't really replace anything. It's just something new. And there's sometimes experimental budget to spend on those things, but we oftentimes find when you go to kind of expand those accounts, when you go to enterprise, to do the real enterprise selling, it's harder to get higher and higher price points because you know, you're not, you, there's just no line item, there's no budget for it. Um, the user experience tends to be pretty, pretty key. Does it, does it offer an amazing experience? Uh, heavy bit that an um, uh, incubator for developer-focused companies that we're involved with calls this the DX, the developer experience. It doesn't, maybe it doesn't have to be beautiful in the traditional way that we think of consumer apps, but is it intuitive? It, does, it, does it speak to the uh, user in a way that allows them um, to very quickly be able to figure out how to use the tool uh, and get all the functionality that's there? Uh, again, this is, an er this is a, a law or a criteria that probably did not exist in, in technical-focused businesses 20 years ago where it was just about what functionality you had. It wasn't about how intuitive it was. And this tends, to be, this tends to be pretty critical when developers are choosing which piece of technology to adopt or whether to, whether to try some new thing or not. Um, strong network effects, and this, this, I'll, I'll use the GitHub example on this because it's sort of an obvious example of network effects. Does the business get stronger because more and more uh, customers are on it? GitHub's uh, it, it's sort of intuitive to see why that is, is more and more developers put their code there, put open source code there, becomes more valuable. Uh, for folks to, to use GitHub as a place to find that code, and then that ties nicely into their business uh, with their enterprise products. Um, if there's a strong network effect, that just creates a stickier and stickier product. So we're, in, we're investors in NPM, uh, you know, sort of the default module registry for, for JavaScript, and as more and more code comes through their package manager, it becomes more and more, it becomes harder and harder to say, hey, I'm going to use something else because it, the dependency is greater and greater. Uh, and so to the extent that there's a, a way to make a business more valuable as more and more people use it, uh, that, um, that, that just creates more stickiness and more lock-in. Uh, and then finally, um, does this eliminate a non-core skill set in the enterprise? If it's something core to what the enterprise is doing, it's, it's their core business, it becomes harder to, to take that piece of functionality and outsource it or use, a, use someone else's technology. But if it's something non-core, and the obvious example here is Stripe, nobody really wants to figure out, if you're an e-commerce company, you don't want to figure out how payment gateways work and how, you know, doing deals with aggregators and anti-fraud tools and things like that. That's not really core to what an e-commerce shop is doing. If you can use Stripe, they'll do all that for you. That's non-core to your business. And so does this eliminate the need for some non-score skill set? You can put more dollars into engineering your own product and not figuring out fraud or payments or security or authentication or all of that stuff. Um, so those are, the, those are the types of things we look for. Um, as I said, we've been investing in this space for almost a decade. It goes back to our investment in Twilio in 2009. Um, and we're continuing to look at you know, interesting ideas. These are just some of them. And you know, every year, there's more and more really exciting companies that, that result from this roadmap. And you know, we're really excited to have been one of the early ones to, to, to make these investments. And so I'm excited to, to welcome up, at this point, um, two of those investments, Harry Glazer. Harry's the founder CEO of, um, of Periscope Data, which we backed. Oop. <laughs> Harry's also a noted gymnast. He's going to perform for us. Thank you, thank um, you. Uh, oh, thank you. Actually, keep that around in case I want to go back a slide. Yeah? Okay. Yeah. 
just leave it there. Um, which we invested in in 2016, as I said. Here, I'll keep it with me. And then Alex Solomon. Alex the founder and CTO of PagerDuty, which we invested in 2014 and I think was founded 2011, a couple of years ago? 2009. 2009. Oh, wow. Veteran. Great. Well, so, so I thought we'd start. Um, I want to give you guys a chance to critique the laws and some of the stuff we talked about, but maybe start with the founding story as to why, why you guys chose to build the businesses that you did, and which of these observations, if any, sort of played into that decision? I should go first? All right. Uh, hey, everyone. I'm Harry. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Periscope Data. Um, and we started in, I think, 2012 uh, because I really wanted to work with my co-founder, Tom. Uh, and that was really the whole reason. So uh, I don't know if anybody's ever met somebody who like went to college with Barack Obama or something like that. but. You get this story always like, you knew even then when he was 18 years old that he was going to be president someday. Um, that was what rooming with uh, my roommate, my college roommate Tom was like. He was the most technical, the smartest, also the most popular, also the most charismatic. It's not that common, I guess this group might know, it's not that common for the best coder to also be the most popular guy in the class. Um, and uh, it was really, it was a challenging four years for me in a good way, just keeping up with him. Um, so later, after, after college, I went to Google, he went to Microsoft, he worked on uh, the machine learning behind Bing search ranking. Um, and I worked at Google on ads product. And the sort of key career realization that I had was after three or four years at Google, uh, Tom is still the best engineer that I know. And he's like, you know, squirreled away in Seattle working at Microsoft on things that don't matter, a search engine that's never going to win. And, um, <laughs> and um, I decided that someday he's going to invent something that changes the world. And if I am standing next to him when that happens, then I get to take half the credit. Uh, and that'll be a really good career move for me. And that turned out to be true. Uh, and so that was really great. And uh, I eventually convinced him to leave his job, his girlfriend, his city, and all his friends, pack his life into, this is a true story. And actually, I will say, skill at recruiting is probably maybe the most important thing when you're starting a company. Um, and so, yeah, we, um, he abandoned all of those things that don't matter anyway, piled his life into his car, drove to San Francisco, uh, arrives at 2 in the morning, and texts me like, hey, I'm here, can I sleep on your couch? And I'm asleep at two in the morning and I miss the text and he sleeps in the car. And uh, I still hear about this to this day, six years later, like you're paying for drinks tonight because I had to sleep in the car that one night in 2012. Um, anyway, we spent the next year or so working on uh, good ideas for businesses that turned out to be terrible ideas. And all of them failed and we ended up building, and they were all sort of these top down kind of, oh, I think the market's going this way and we have this idea for capturing this market or whatever nonsense. And we were wrong every time and we built Periscope as a side project to look at the data from the other things that we were building. Um, and it was the little side project that could and ended up getting two paying customers by itself while we weren't focusing on it. I remember somebody asked me if they could use it and they offered to pay me to host it for them. And they said, just send me an invoice. And I had to Google like how to send an invoice. Um, <laughs> And that, you know, uh, once we had two paying customers, which was something we had not achieved in our year of business ideas, I decided, okay, this must be something that's for real. And we raised some seed funding, hired a, more, a couple more engineers and, um, and launched it. And it grew like 500x in three years by itself. By itself. I mean, we were, we were certainly hiring and building a team, but I think it had its own momentum, um, which was something that we were really proud of and also something we totally stumbled upon. Um, so I don't, what did we do right in that whole story and what's, how does it relate to this? I think um, having a really good founding team and having really strong technical talent, having talent that can empathize directly with the end user, which is something I think you talk about a little bit, like um, developer CEOs who are selling to developers themselves. And I think uh, one thing I would add is recruiting and hiring becomes a really big, maybe the most important part of the story. Great. Alex? Sure. So um, a little bit of a different story for me. Um, so I met my two co-founders in college, um, and we all kind of wanted to do something. We knew we were reading uh, Y Combinator as um, you know Hacker News, and we were reading Paul Graham's essays, and we knew we had this itch to do something. After college, I went to work at Amazon um, uh, up in Seattle, and was was a software engineer there. And Amazon did this thing where you, when you join, you get your developer desktop, your laptop, and a pager and you go on call. You basically are, you write code, you test it yourself, you deploy it to production, and you are on call for that, the stuff that you wrote. 
it's all service oriented or microservices. And this is back like 15 years ago. Uh, Amazon was one of the pioneers of moving to a service oriented architecture. They're one of the pioneers of DevOps before DevOps was even a coined term. Um, and, uh, you know, having lived that, having carried the pager at Amazon, although it sucks to, you know, get woken up in the middle of the night, um, it actually makes the systems that you build better. It makes them more resilient. You care about how they operate in production. And you also, it makes you a better developer because you're not just writing stuff and then throwing it to another team to worry about it in production. So um, we kind of saw the, the, you know, realized that this DevOps thing was for real and was going to be the future. That was one key thing. And then secondly, the way we came up with the ultimate idea is we thought, well, what kind of things have big companies like Amazon had to build in-house that everyone else needs? So we thought, well, you know, there's this employee directory tool, but that seems kind of small. Um, what about that PagerDuty thing? And uh, instantly we jumped on, on the Google and checked the domain and it was available. So that was a big part of the founding story. If the domain hadn't been there, who knows? I'm shocked. <laughs> and uh, registered it and just jumped right on it because we realized, well, Amazon built this tool in-house to handle on-call scheduling and alerting. Uh, Google built something as well. Facebook built something as well. Like all the tech companies that care about this stuff uh, all had to basically reinvent the wheel and build this thing. So we took a shot. Uh, we started with the initial product being very focused on on-call management and alerting and uh, sitting on top of your monitoring tools, aggregating all of your uh, alerts and events, and making sure that when something goes wrong, when you have an outage or an incident, uh, that you get the right people um, alerted and on the problem as quickly as possible, and then nothing falls through the cracks. And one of the really cool things, besides the obvious value of, hey, your outages, you, know, you can respond faster and shorten your outages, uh, the other cool thing that we saw from our early customers is they, they came to us and they said, we love PagerDuty. And I was like, wow, OK, I, we wake you up in the middle of the night. That was actually our first tagline, we wake you up in ship breaks. Um, <laughs> but um, <laughs> yeah, um, we, they, they came to us and they said, we love PagerDuty. And we, we were like, wow, that's really cool. I mean, yeah, give us the love. We, we, that's great. But, but why? It's because we actually help people sleep better at night because now they have an on-call process. They know when they're on call. They know when they're not on call and can go out to the bars and live their life as normal. Whereas before PagerDuty, it was all like chaos and everyone's on call all the time and some people become the heroes while other people shy away from it and never actually respond to any of these pages. So from that initial product, we expanded the vision to cover the entire incident lifecycle. A lot of stuff around uh, event triage and noise reduction and automatically clustering events together. Um, orchestrating a larger uh, response across multiple different teams, notifying stakeholders, the business people that need to know what's going on when there's an outage, um, helping all those folks collaborate and communicate, plug into Slack, plug into uh, conference uh, bridges and tools like that, and then finally the learn step of uh, conducting a postmortem and having a set of analytics and metrics on top of it all so you can see how how your systems are performing, how your people are performing. So we took a focus on the people side of things from, from early days when that has been one of our big assets because there's a lot of tools and platforms out there that care about the systems, but we have had that people focus from early on and that's caused that developer love that's helped along because people are, people are passionate when they get woken up. They, get, they have a lot of feels about that. I can imagine. Um, well, I always like to, before I make an investment, hear the founding story. And what was so resonant in both of those is that you both lived these problems, both in the company you were building in, at Amazon, so you could have complete empathy with both the problem and the solution. So it's, can, I, can I tell the story of how you guys invested in us? Yeah, please. So uh, Ethan and, uh, uh, and his partner at uh, Bessemer at the time, they actually uh, bought two pagers for me and my co-founder, Andrew. They made them work somehow. I guess pager networks are still around. That's not easy to do, by the and way. They if anyone they, wants to they, know, they, they delivered them to our office, and then they paged us saying, "Congratulations, <laughs> we have a deal." So that was pretty sweet. That's great. Didn't uh, didn't you build an application using Twilio, like in their pitch meeting? And we try to use the products wherever we can. It was hard to use PagerDuty to page you, so we we kind of hacked it. We did build an app in Twilio, nice. a term sheet delivery line, which if anybody wants, I can give you the number. You can, you can get a term sheet from, from us that, <laughs> via the Twilio line. Um, but stepping back a bit, um, I'd love to hear, so I just sort of gave my theoretical investor view on what's interesting about these technical businesses. What, 
like critique it for me. What what was the one thing that you felt that I got right? That like, yes, that makes sense and it applies to my business. And what was the one thing that didn't that just did not resonate? You're like I, I don't what you said I I don't get it or it doesn't I don't think it applies to to Periscope or to PagerDuty. Uh, well, I think um, I think the the seven things that you laid out that are um, sort of the the tenets, and not, you mentioned not all of them have to be have to apply to every single business, but are generally the foundations of strong um, you know developer companies. I think those were generally good. I think um, uh, and I think they're generally applicable. I mean, I think you know all of the folks here, some of you may want to start companies, and I think they're good guidelines around how to price your product, how to sell your product, you know, the kind of land and expand model, the uh, replace a budget item so that you can, you know, eventually grow. I think that all makes sense. Um, so I thought that part was really great. Um, the part that made my eyes glaze over a little bit was the sort of top-down financial deconstruction, like the uh, fraction of sales and marketing spend for these public developer companies and the, uh, the sort of highlights from, I guess, the... Um, AWS financials, and that, I think, um, was more of a finance professional speaking to other finance professionals about what's good about developer businesses. But for me, if I'm starting out, it's like, okay, how do I hire engineers? How do I price this product? How do I get customers? How do I sell? I mean, a lot of the challenges around developer-facing businesses are you have this developer CEO who has to learn all these new skills, right? Like, and I think that might be more of a challenge in developer businesses than other businesses where this developer who's the CEO has to learn sales, has to learn management. Um, and that stuff I think is more resonant than by the time you're a hundred million dollar company, you should be spending 30% of your, uh, of your revenue on sales and marketing. That will become more resonant later on. Sounds good. And Alex? Yeah, for, for me, what really stood out, I mean, the seven commandments uh, were spot on except for one. Uh, that's the metered billing one, which uh, I, I think that's one that, um, depending on the business that you run, it may apply or it may not. And the way you price and package your solution is very dependent on what it is. So for, for us, we have a per user based pricing and that's the only logical way we can price PagerDuty. There's no way to meter it. We don't want to price it on a per alert basis or per incident basis or punish companies when they have lots of alerts and incidents and they have a bad week or bad month. So, just per user, and what, what we've learned over time is uh, doing it in a very predictable way. That's, that's one of the downsides of metered billing because it's hard to predict your bill ahead of time when you can ramp up and down and scale up servers and storage and this and that, and you have a spike in usage and, oh crap, our bill is now double. Uh, whereas uh, if you can, I would say don't do metered billing if possible because your customers are going to want predictability. They're going to want to do a budget for a year or even multiple years, and they want to know what they're going to spend on your tool when you get to those bigger price points, when it's not just on a credit card. So, so what we found in terms of how to address that is what about some sort of like a cell phone type plan where you get, it's still metered, but you're, get, you're allowing for some predictability through buckets of, you know, this many text messages, this, this much volume through the system. Because you don't want to lose the ability to spike people up when they use more of you. But I take your point. You don't want it to be totally unpredictable and wild either. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it comes down to what service you're selling. If you're, if you're Twilio, that's the only way you can do it. If you're AWS, that's the only way you can do it. It's not really a, so much of a choice, honestly. If you're selling, if you're... Uh, if your service is SMSs or phone calls, then you have to charge on, on that unit. Or if you're someone like a logging company where you deal with logs like, say, Splunk or LogDNA, you charge on volume of data because that's the only logical way to do it. It's not, I don't see it as much of a choice, really. So I, I instinctively agreed with what Alex was saying, and I think it's a challenge we've run into, too, and we've moved to more of a cell phone plan model versus a raw metered pricing. And I think there's a nuance here around who you're selling to and how that changes over time. So when you're small and you're selling to developers, developers like metered pricing because they understand it. They are skeptical of pricing that doesn't seem to line up with your costs. They are skeptical of sales-driven pricing in general. Um, and if you say, okay, two, two text messages cost twice as much as one text message, they get it. When you move up the chain to somebody who owns a budget or even into procurement or finance, they don't value that, those kind of fundamentals as much as they value predictability for their business. They want to sign an annual contract and they want it to not change mid-year because they're making an annual budget as they get started. And so as the business grows up, you end up moving to let's sign an annual contract for hopefully a lot of money that won't then grow over the course of the year. 
Yeah. Makes sense. Let, let's shift. Do you want to say something else? Or? I would just say I, I agree 100%. And you, you get pricing models like Slack's uh, fair usage, where if someone doesn't log in into Slack to use it at all for an entire month, they just give you, they just take it off your bill. So there are different ways to play around with it to make it so that people can go over their limit and then you don't punish them. Maybe you just give them a call and say, hey, should we, is it time to up your, your usage? Those, that's a good way, that's a friendly way to, to do business. So it seems like the theme is find ways to allow them to spend more without it being a surprise. And metering can lead to surprises, but uh, the general concept of you, you use more, eventually you're going to pay more you like. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Same. Cool. Um, let's shift gears to marketing. So starting early on, um, as we've said, and I think you guys would agree, developers are very hard to sell to. They're going to pick the product or any technical buyer that, that most meets their needs. But you do have to get the word out somehow. So maybe talk about the early days or how you have come, your view, how it's come to evolve of how to market to this type of an audience. Yeah, in the earliest days, uh, content was the thing that worked really well for us. And it was like very uh, technical, very niche content. Um, and so we wrote, I mean, the, the, to this day, the highest performing blog post we've ever written is how to optimize Postgres subquery joins. And um, this is like totally, if there's marketers in the room, this is, I think there are, this is like totally counterintuitive, right? It's like a very niche thing. But man, like we own that search query. Like if you want to optimize Postgres subquery joins, like we are the place to learn about that. And we have like, I don't know, probably a hundred of these blog posts now that are all about like the thorny things that you run into, the technical challenges around doing data analysis with SQL, which is a language that everybody uses for data analysis that was not intended for data analysis when it was written. And so... Uh, that, like, it did two things. One, it gets us reach within our little niche. And, uh, and two, it demonstrates an authentic voice, right? It's clear that the people who are doing the marketing on behalf of this company are themselves data analysts and can relate to you. And developers and other technical audiences really value that. They really value that they are talking to a peer and not like a marketing drone or a sales drone. Um, the other thing that's counterintuitive that I think people have to learn or get over is in the early days, you don't have to worry about how big the total audience is. You want to worry much more about what's really resonant with that audience, even if it's small. Like if you can find your corner of the world and really, really own it, that's a really great base to build from. If you're, really, if you're doing what most people do instinctively, which is talk in a really shallow way to a broad group of people, it becomes very hard to differentiate. Yeah, and, uh, I mean, content marketing, I 100% agree with. For us, what, what really worked early on was um, we solved the real hair on fire problem. And our customers, when they saw it, we got a lot of reactions like, oh, I built this myself in a kind of hacky way. So we were mostly competing with homegrown solutions. So, and uh, at the same time, we were riding the DevOps wave. Like DevOps was becoming a thing. And uh, a community of folks uh, started to form around that. They were very active on Twitter. They were very active at conferences, going and attending conferences and speaking at conferences. So for us, word of mouth. Uh, aided by this this uh, burgeoning trend and and these uh, um, DevOps luminaries, if you will, going and speaking, um, really worked for us. Like we we tried Google AdWords, we tried all kinds of things, and nothing really stuck except for word of mouth, organic growth, people talking about us, and and also uh, going to events. And uh, we we sponsored like one of the early Velocity events here in uh, the Bay Area. And we had a little booth, uh, which is a little bit out of the way. But what happened is in one of the big keynotes, uh, one of the keynote speakers mentioned PagerDuty. And we got flooded with folks coming from that big keynote saying, what's, Pager, what's this PagerDuty thing? I need to know. We saw a big spike in, in revenue that way. And of course, it went back down, but the base got bigger. And over time, that word of mouth continued. And uh, we got more and more mentions at conferences. I would say uh, the way to really push this forward is to get that developer advocacy going, or that DevOps advocacy, we call it DevOps advocacy, going and applying at conferences, speaking at conferences. If you're a founder, uh, if you have CEO or CTO or one of these titles, people are, are dying to get great speakers. So develop those skills and start, you can start small with meetups and uh, uh, develop your public skills and, and have interesting things to talk about and you build that or organic word of mouth. How did you early on get luminaries to speak about PagerDuty? Was that something you did uh, tactically did, or it just sort of happened? I think it just kind of sort of happened, and uh, we were solving that hair on fire problem. So people were like, hey, you got to check out this thing. And our community, 
uh, people, when they find a new tool or a new uh, thing or a new open source project that they're excited about, they're going to go talk about it. They're going to go talk about, you know, th again, DevOps was kind of taking off. So everyone was talking about, oh, let's do CI, CD and lots of deploys. Oh, let's put developers on call. All of these things people were starting to talk about. And whenever they mentioned on call, PagerDuty came along with that. It was on call PagerDuty. So we were fortunate to be in the right place at the right time solving the right problem. Great. So, so maybe shifting gears one more time, uh, it's been my observation that developers are picky, finicky. <laughs> they uh, are not shy about telling you what they like and don't like, but are also very demanding about what, what technology they will use. And so I imagine, so first of all, do you agree or disagree with that? And then I imagine that sets up some, some, some tough customer success challenges in terms of keeping them happy and keeping, uh, you know, keeping customers, uh, you know, productive with your products. Man, all right, so there is so much to unpack there. So, uh, yes, they're unbelievably finicky. And it's so funny, like, all go to, we now have, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of bigger customers and, and customers paying us hundreds of thousands of dollars, and that budget is owned by someone relatively senior in a relatively big company, and I'll go on site to visit them. And the first, like, 40 minutes of this conversation will be a laundry list of little nitpicks when I have the autocomplete open and I hit tab, it doesn't do the autocomplete like I wanted. It inserts a tab character. How could you do this? And I'm like, we're here for a like $300,000 renewal and we're talking about the tab <laughs> character. This happens to me like three times a week. Um, and we, our, our support team maintains a list of these requests, stack ranked by who's asked for them and how many people have asked for them. And it numbers in like the tens of thousands or something like this. Um, I, don't, I don't know that there's an answer here. Um, being authentic as the representative of the company that you understand that problem, that you empathize with that problem. I get a lot of requests for a dark mode in the SQL editor instead of a light mode. And smiling and nodding and talking about how your favorite IDE has that too and we'd love to add it. And like being clear that you understand the thing and that you empathize with the thing and that you too write SQL in the product is really important. And then what's harder is then all of your CSMs, when you start to hire a customer success team, have to be able to do this too. Um, CSM at Periscope Data is a really hard job for this reason. Uh, customer support at Periscope Data is a really hard job for this reason. And I don't, we haven't found any shortcuts. We insist on people that can understand this stuff. We train them up. People learn to write SQL in the product as part of doing this job. Um, and it, when they like you and they, like the, the flip side of it is when they like you and they find that you are one of them and, and that you empathize with them and that you value their concerns, they're eager to upgrade. They're actually very loyal. Um, and they are, like, they don't, you know, they're not eager to, like, look at a competitor because they're inherently skeptical of that sales process. And they think that, you know, you're one of them and they want to they wanna stick with you whenever possible. So, I don't know. It's just hard work. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I would say... I, I love the fact that developers are very vocal because they will tell you like it is. They're not going to tell you, oh, your product's great. Uh, now, see you later. I'm not going to give you any money. They're going to tell you uh, what's wrong with it. They're going to tell you uh, feature requests. They're going to be proactive about this. Um, and at every, every event that we go to, we get folks saying, oh, I love PagerDuty, but can you do this and this? And, and that kind of feedback is so valuable. Um, it, being in another field where you're de dealing with, like, salespeople or marketing people, you may not get that same level of feedback. So I, I love the transparency and the directness. I would also say, um, to your point, they, the developers become loyal with the product. And since this is API mixtape, uh, I should mention APIs. Like This is one of the decisions that we made early on with the product. We decided, let's make everything that we build that you can touch with an UI also have an API. And we're actually going to build our own UIs on top of APIs and the mobile app on top of our own APIs that are open to everyone. And that's a great thing because developers love that. We have now co companies that are the more advanced companies that are driving their entire PagerDuty configuration through uh, GitHub and checked uh, you know, code reviews and pull requests and all that good stuff. Um, and they drive it through our API. So you don't actually go in the UI and click, click, and change configs. They're all automated. Um, and the other thing that comes with great, having great APIs is when a developer or a company comes and they say, we need this feature request, we can always say, well, you know, you can do it this way, there's a workaround here, or you can actually build it on top of our API and make it work for yourself. And we've had a lot of that as well, which is awesome to see. Great. Um, so if my math is right, we have two more minutes. I have one more question, but I wanted to give a chance if anyone wants to ask something. It's okay. It's fine. I, <laughs> We don't have a mic for you, but I think we'll be able to hear you. Okay, I'll, I'll ask my question. If it comes to you, shout it out. Um, so pivoting off the sort of 
developer topic for a second. You guys are founders of big, successful companies now, so, you know, several years through the sort of wandering in the desert trying to find product market fit. What's the biggest surprise of that journey? What's the biggest surprise? It's something that is not obvious, that's not, oh yeah, it was really hard, I knew it would be tough, but that you just did not expect having gone through that process. First of all, I don't think any of it's obvious. So I think my journey, I, I can't speak for Alex or anyone else, but my journey has been uh, a surprise every step of the way, and I, and I knew things to learn and, and grow at every step of the way, and I'm, I have been bad at literally all of the things to do with my job before having to get good at them. Um, I think the, the, the biggest transition that sticks out in my mind is that, and this happens at maybe 50 employees, um, it really becomes only about the people on the team and you know, associated process and culture and um, the way that the team works together. And that's really, as founder and CEO, the only way that you can impact results at that point in time. And so you, you make this transition from actually coding, actually designing, actually specking out features, actually selling to when you try to do those things, you actually harm the results in those areas. Like I remember building features and then the engineers would have to support them because I'd be off fundraising or they'd get paged for shit that I wrote and they wouldn't understand it. Um, and you, you know, all the way up to if I'm micromanaging the sales process, um, it causes the sales team to wig out and not do a good job because they're so freaked out by me micromanaging them. Um, and so you learn to, uh, I'm a product manager by trade. Before this, I was a PM. And um, I've started to think of the team and the culture as my product. Like if you can put together the right team and get the right culture and process going, then the rest of it takes care of itself, often in ways that are much better than you ever imagined because you actually have no idea what you're doing in these areas. Um, that was for me probably the biggest surprise of all. Yeah, I mean, there's there's tons, tons along the way. And I was a you know software engineer, didn't do product management before, didn't do sales before, didn't manage people before. So I had to learn all these things on the job. Um, one of the big ones early on was we didn't believe in sales. We're, you know, we're developers. We go to a web website, we read the website, we put in a credit card or start a free trial, and then we're good to go. We don't need to talk to people. And I know those people are going to drive the price up. So I don't want to even use products that have salespeople. That was my mentality going in. And um, after starting the company, I changed my mind, obviously. So I started doing the, the sales myself. I tried to do it via email as much as possible because I, that's how I imagined most people wanted to interact. And it's so much faster to pick up the phone and just get it done. Um, and what happened for us is we hired this intern uh, who was doing like market research for us. And one day he said, can I do sales? And I was kind of doing it myself, but not doing it full justice because I was doing five other things. So I asked him, well, have you done it before? Yes, he had actually um, at Salesforce. So I said, yeah, go, go ahead and do it. And then quickly thereafter, we hired our second salesperson. They're still with the company today. They are engineers who have turned into salespeople. So they're not your typical kind of, uh, they, they need to have a lot of process around them. They're entrepreneurial and they figured it all it, a lot of it out for themselves. And they've been very successful with the company. And Right after we hired them, we saw a spike in revenue. So it, was, it was, became pretty evident that sales was a thing and that we needed to invest in it and that we needed to invest in the right kind of sales, not top-down enterprise, you know, take them out to the golf course, but quick on the phone, get, get transactional, help the customer along the journey type sales. And since we've evolved quite a bit, this was back in like 2012. So that's one big one for us. Great. Well, thank you both for both joining me on stage and letting me invest in your company. It's been, been a pleasure. And thanks to Greg for uh, inviting us to do this panel at Readme. It's been a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you all very much. Thank you.